It's going live. It's live now. We'll give it that a minute. I'll get my 60 second timer in there. Hold on. I don't have to what? Hello everybody, guess what? It's me, I'm back, impromptu and live. Yes, I'm Travis Blaze here at sketch to animate and uh, I thought I would just do something really fun and fast and quick. Um, I have some time, I'm on standby with work. So I thought while I'm on standby with work, uh, I was gonna do something a little impromptu with my friend Jasno Francoeur, who I will be bringing on in just a minute. Um, Jasno had something interesting of a challenge for me, and that was to do uh, create a character based on a lecture series that he is a part of. He's doing. He he signed up for school. Uh, it's it's a world building class that he signed up for. Uh, that's what Jasno does. He likes to sign up for these eclectic kind of things to expand his knowledge. But what's really cool about it is that um, he is, well, I'll let him explain a little bit further what it is. And maybe you guys might want to join us at some later date. But it's a, it's a series class that uh, he's piled in with 80 other people that are literally learning about worlds outside of our own planet. And as, a, as sort of a, a test or during the class, they are actually developing their own planet world. And so he challenged me to create a creature based on that planet. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring Jasno on and uh, we're going to have a little intro and talk about it. And we can talk to Jasno about who he is and what he does. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just dive into the drawing. So hold on one second. Let me, let me grab uh, Mr. Jasno Francoeur. And there we go. Hello, Jasno. Hi, Travis. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Yeah, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm going to look in the chat room real quick, see if there's anyone. In. Oh, look, we do have people in the chat room. We got Cesar, we got Life Fantasy X, Brush Mechanic. Can you guys hear me okay? I just want to make sure. I think, yes. We got Faras. We got more people coming on here in a second. Uh, <laughs> what's happened, you? <laughs> what's happened is that I have been busy with work. That's what's happened. But um, say hello, Jasno, to everyone out there that's on here so far. Can you guys uh, give me a thumbs up? Give me a thumbs up, everyone, if you can hear us. Uh, and that'll be a good sign. Uh, but Jasno, say hello to our, my little friend Spring there. He's, he's bouncing across the screen below you. <laughs> say hi. Hi, That's very cute, Travis. Hi, Spring. 
Ice spring. Yeah. Yeah. Is that on fours? Yeah. Uh, no, no, that's not on fours. That's that's on ones. That's at thirty frames a second. What? Yeah. Well, oh. you're streaming it. Not. It's my buffer. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not it. So yeah. when I get this recording, I can give it to you, and it'll be thirty frames per second, flawless. But uh, yes, our, our, everyone says yes, they can hear us, so that's good. So um, here we go. We are going to do something impromptu, which is, Jasno, if you want to explain to the world, who are you? Who's Jasno Francor? <laughs> who is Jasno? Well, so I, Travis, uh, uh, I have been on your show once before, briefly. Uh, and of course, I've been to your, your wonderful attic, uh, your, your new uh, yes. uh, recording space, which is very homey. Uh, it looks very warm and inviting. Uh, but for those who were in that last session, um, I am a VFX animator, traditional VFX animator. And I worked with Travis for many years at the Mouse House. And uh, Travis and I started when we were pretty young, so we've had an opportunity to watch each other grow old. That's always a really fun thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I've known I've known you, what, about 30, well over 30 years 30 now. years um, and counting. Um, I've seen you through, uh, let's see, uh, two, two, two weddings. Uh, I was actually, I, I married you off twice. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's great, Travis. That, that's very artfully said. You could have said two divorces, you chose two, two weddings. But no, you know, you get to be our age, then, then it'll be like four, four weddings and a few funerals. Uh, all that notwithstanding, um, Travis is so kind to invite me on today because I gave him a challenge. Uh, I'm taking a class with a wonderful astrophysicist and folklorist, uh, Harvard educated, uh, named uh, Moya McTeer. And uh, there's a little pitch for her class. It's called Facts Based World Building. And uh, anyone can sign up for it, and uh, it's not that expensive. Um, we're about five courses in, uh, starting today, of an eight-course series. So five... And the idea... Wait, wait, five... It's yeah, it's we're, it's a five-part... It's how eight-part series, and you're five courses... It's eight-part series, and we're now five five in, starting today. And is, it is about and, uh, world building, and it's taught by an astrophysicist, folklore... Uh, and a folklorist. And a yeah. folklorist. So her particular... Yes. So her perspective is coming really more from the hard science side um, as, as a writer. And, and the workshop, of course, is for anyone who's either a writer or any kind of visual development artist uh, to develop worlds, uh, to develop uh, worlds and creatures and things that populate those worlds that are facts-based. And so she begins by talking about uh, building the stellar system. Then we move into uh, building the actual planet. And then we go into building the life on the planet, and then eventually on down to the social systems, the folklore, the religion, the economy, the politics, um, all of those things. So where we are right now, we have a planet in a what's called a K system, which is a, it's, it's a smaller star, uh, and that means that the smaller stars have a much longer lifespan. Uh, that means there's a lot more opportunity for life to evolve over a much longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the parameters of this particular class is to take this uh, this planet, and there's uh, five in the system orbiting this uh, star, which I believe is close to the galactic center. In the, uh, so it might also have a fair amount of uh, meteors hitting it because it's a little closer to uh, also cosmic ray radiation, that kind of thing. So these animals will be very sturdy, and, and who knows, maybe the life cycle had to regenerate, um, just like we had on Earth uh, two different times, uh, meteors hit and destroyed uh, life, but life always comes back. Now, of course, um, as you saw, Travis, recently from that one series I shared with you, most of what we think about in life is carbon-based life forms, but life could also be silicon-based, uh, and it could even be uh, any other number of factors. Uh, and of course, all that depends on um, a lot of different things. So for instance, the life could be right. very affected mm -hmm. by climate. That climate can be affected by you know, the tilt of your world. So I think we're at what, about 20, 20 some percent, the Earth. But if you were to tilt by a 45 degree angle, and the poles would suddenly be the tropics, and then you'd have a planet that uh, our planet is going to be there for more mercurial, but also more water-based. So all of our creatures or characters that have intelligent life that develop um, have that sort of in common, that they are water dwellers. Okay, so... So we have three... So, real yeah. quick. So, 
why, I, the, my, my one question real quick, and I want to make sure that, um, why did you find this interesting? And because everyone in here, everyone knows that Sketch to Anime is a story-driven community. We are, our brand is all about story, uh, storytelling through the art of animation. Um, why in particular do you think you were, you wanted to do this and explain why you think this might be an important thing for others as artists and storytellers to uh, possibly take this course? Well, you know, that's a really great question, um, but I would say all of us are visual storytellers, and I don't care if you're designing props, uh, painting backgrounds, doing visual effects, uh, characters, everything that you do automatically um, has story kind of built into it. Um, but, you know, I, I think the gold standard in storytelling is to suspend your disbelief. You know, the, the idea that, uh, that you're not aware, uh, that you're not taken out of the story by things that, uh, that might otherwise uh, take you out. So, for instance, you know, and I'll tell you one thing is that uh, directors automatically have the gift from the audience. That we, we will automatically give that to the director. Uh, they don't necessarily have to earn it as much in the beginning. So we're not going to question that there's talking deer. Or we're not going to question that there's aliens. But what we do question is consistency. So classes like this can be great because they can really help you um, have kind of an armature for connecting all the different elements of your story, you know? Well, we were talking earlier, Travis, about, you know, well, what happens if it's not a chlorophyll-based world? And what if it's a different compound? Well, maybe instead of your world being really green, maybe it's gonna be purple, right? So that could be something that, w in terms of continuity, would connect all the characters. Maybe the, the fauna and flora all have kind of like uh, that, those kind of pigments, so, for instance. So as, um, as you're talking, I am, um and just so you guys know, I just, uh, you can see probably now why I thought it would be cool to kind of do this impromptu thing with you guys um, because uh, I'm fascinated by this. I'm, I'm actually interested in taking this project or taking this class. But I think also as, as someone who's wor building worlds like Ark or Wangle or other things, uh, everything is about world building in our make-believe lands that we create. Um, even if it's based on sh fictional shows grounded within our own reality or our own world, um, I think this is great to to kind of it, it like it really got the creative mind, uh, my creativity flowing uh, to really want to be uh, a part of this. And also, <laughs> I made a promise to Jez that I would draw this hexacat, <laughs> and he needs it by five o'clock today. So. Woo and this is a great excuse for that. Yes. So, so um, as he, yeah, like, as he, like, wait, wait, as he continues to talk, you'll find this. We interrupt each other a lot, but or me more than him. <laughs> um, I'm the interrupting artist. Um, I'm gonna draw his Earth, and he sees me. I, I think I'm still sharing with you, correct? So, yeah, I so mm -hmm. as I am drawing, he can, he can, he can explain a little bit more about the class and what he's doing and why it's important. But also, as I'm drawing this. He can, this, I'm, I'm right now going to create the world so you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. So go ahead. Well, certainly, so the procession or, or the angle rather of the, uh, the planet will certainly be a determinant um, of like weather systems and that kind of thing, but also gravity, right? So um, how far your, your planet is from, from the star and, uh, and gravity, of course, you know, that, that has huge implications, particularly if you're land-based. If you're water-based, not so much, especially if you're deep underwater. But once you get onto land, you know, just by altering the, the gravity just a little bit, it could completely determine what kind of a skeletal structure, uh, what kind of muscle masses your characters are going to have. Uh, so a, a world that has really light gravity, like, say, our moon, uh, might have very different ramifications biologically um, on, on a human being than, say, if you were on a, a planet that had a heavier gravity. Case in point, whenever the astronauts go out into outer space, you know, um, in the International Space Station, um, you know, the longer you're out there, the, the, the more negative impact it has on our body because we were not evolutionarily designed to, um, to be in anti-gravity. So we start elongating, uh, our muscles begin to atrophy, uh, weird things happen with our organs. Uh, and so all those, you know, you, you can go down a million rabbit holes, um, you know, but we're really just looking at the bullet points, you know. So again, you know, what's the gravity like? Uh, 
what, it, what is the weather like, um, because that will determine to a large degree. Uh, it'll inform everything from the biology all the way to, as I said earlier, the uh, social practices, you know, the, the type of clothes they wear or don't wear. And of course, in our fictional world, or the one that we've been uh, working on with this class, uh, there are three uh, main characters. Uh, one of them we started with was called the Dodecapus. Okay. It's a, basically like an octopus-like uh, creature with 12 arms, but Travis is developing a hexacat. Okay. So it's a more of a with, kind of with, a feline base with six arms. With that being said, real quick, what is the link? People are asking me what the link is. Uh, well, the name of the class is called um, uh, Facts Based World Building. And, and is there a link? Moya. Is there a link that I can send them to? Uh, let me take a look. I'll, uh, I'll I'll take a gander because obviously I'm taking the class, so it's more internal. But let's see if I can find a link that you can put in your chat. Yeah, I want to I want to put the link in the chat for people yeah. that might be interested in this as well. Um, and um, what I want you to do is as um, as we talk about the the hexacat, once you finish up talking about the hexacat, um, let's talk about the world because I'm going to build this world real quick for them so to kind of get an idea of of what we're talking about, um, which I, which is what I've just started here, and then we'll go into actually drawing uh, the uh, this this thing. Okay, so let's see here. You sent me a link. Yeah, uh, so that's the link to the uh, course. And of course, uh, as I said, we'll be wrapping up here in the next three weeks, but I'm sure that uh, Moya will be running the course again. And she's doing this through Atlas Obscura. And they are a uh, kind of a company that is dedicated to wonder. Okay. And uh, like Travis said, more, more eccentric kind of pursuits sometimes. That's awesome. Well, you keep talking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this link in because I have to manually type it in here. Um, oh. So one thing I uh, one thing I also wanted to mention is that um, so like I said there's there's three basic characters uh, obviously uh, we could go go down uh, many many other rabbit holes but for the sake of this world we're just looking at three different characters with three different cultures and so the Dodecapus that I mentioned that is the the uh, character that is well it has bioluminescence it's kind of like an octopus but it's got twelve uh, tentacles okay uh, has has intelligence. Awesome. Do you want to um, maybe share that real quick? Um, share your screen real quick, and um, I'll stop. I'll stop. Uh, see if I can. See. Well, let me find it real quick before I do that. Um, Actually, you you I posted it on your Facebook. you posted it, correct? I did on my Facebook. So if you just go to my Facebook, it should be. Okay, there. if you go to um, Jasno Francoeur. Um, and Francoeur is F R A N C O E U R, um, and you will see that. Um, do you have an Instagram account as well? Um, I do, but I didn't post it on. That. Okay, you should also post it on that as well, and because I will send people to your your um, Instagram. And what is your Instagram, by the way? Uh <laughs> I've got two. Uh, <laughs> one is just my name. Uh, that's for my uh, uh, VFX stuff, and then I have another one called Yetis Tractatus. But that's just more my photos. But they're both connected. So you just go to my name. Yetis my Miss Yetis your taters. What? <laughs> Yetis Tractatus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yater my tater. <laughs> Yater my tater. Uh, that's that's what I, that's what I think when you say that. Uh, let's see here. Now, mind you, I've known this guy for 30 plus years. Uh, he, he was kind enough. Let's see if that actually pops up. Uh, let's see if this pops up, guys. I'm going to give that a shot. And, uh, let me know if that, that link works. I had to manually type all of that in, and I'm a very slow typer. So, uh, check it out. Let me know if you say, if that pops up, great. If it doesn't, uh, I'll try to post it later on. Um, but um, if you go look up Jasno, uh, if Jasno would send me that image, I can, I can. Sh I'm, yeah, I'm looking for it right now. I can share with you. Okay. Um, and then uh, what we can. Let's see if, can I put it in the chat here? Let's yeah, see. put it in the chat. Put it, okay. and, I'll, and I'll. So this would be, this would be what your hexacat is going to, uh, to hunt. 
Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, so how do I? And meanwhile, while you're, there? Nope. while you're while okay, you're while you're trying it. to do that, I am I'm going to be drawing. Uh, there we go. I found it. Oh, look at that! You sent it to me. See if I can. Uh, how do I download this sucker? Save to downloads. Got it. Downloading now. File is saved. And let's take a look at little. So uh, downloads. Got it. Here we go. I'm going to shrink it down so other people can I see said, this. I said uh, dodecapus, but basically it's a dodecapod. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to open it up into Photoshop as well. So here is the dodecapod, uh, which Jasno, Jasno drew this one in particular. Um, so he asked me to do the hexacat. Uh, oh, awesome! The link works. They said everyone says the link works. So um, this is his. Fantastic. This is the um, the dodecapod. Like I said, um, this is in the world. This creature lives in this world. This is a one of the food sources for the hexacat. Um, yes. And let's go back to this particular thing. Now the world has um, it's it's a little flatter, and it has a forty five degree tilt correct which yeah but so all worlds no matter what their tilt even if they're oblate will probably look rounder the further you get away um, because no planet is perfectly round how do you do 45 yeah, degrees so again is it just one circle or a circle slash not percentage is it just 45 degrees 45 yeah yeah you, you got it okay got it so 45 degree tilt and uh it spins just like earth does and the, and you said because of this, the let's just create um, a, a land mass on this side, and a land mass on this side, uh, and then let's go ahead and draw a few. You said islands. It, it has more mostly uh, islands. Yeah, like arch archipelagos. Archipelagos probably like some volcanoes, but not like huge huge land masses. A lot of water. So I'm just going to, you know, put in a few few worlds let's say uh this one is over here and let's uh, just as imagining it spinning um we got that one then we've got this world uh, so the the poles themselves are going to be more you were saying earlier they're going to be more tropical now how would we yeah, how, how do we know warmer. how do we know that to be the case like since we're creating this world Based on science, how would we know that this would be a tropical well, I mean, uh, it's, poles? It, it's, it's just like the changing of the seasons of our own planet, right? During the winter, we, we we're facing a little further away from the sun, you know. Um, during the, the warmer months, we, we, we are closer to it. Um, you know, one thing I will say <laughs> with great certainty, and one of the reasons why one should take this class, unless you already are a scientist, is that I'm not a scientist at all. Uh, I, like Travis, I'm a visual artist. Um, I have a lot of interest in this kind of thing, uh, but I'm not going to get under the hood uh, or or talk about uh, you know uh, the actual science and mechanics and the physics behind things. Uh, I would say that that the biggest takeaway we're getting from the class is more of a macrocosmic view of everything. Uh, but that's a great thing. Uh, I don't think visual artists need that much information. I, I think that you just need the bullet points. Okay. And um, so, like I said, you know, the distance from the star, the the tilt of the uh, planet, uh, how much gravity is on the planet. Now, now, you um, you said something to me interesting, and 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 I'm I'm drawing the the world in a very simple form right now, showing this the the sun the sun. You were mentioning something earlier. Is the sun a dwarf sun? What what type of sun is this this solar system i think it's closer to like a almost like a brown dwarf or so our own sun would be one solar mass which is a much much larger star so this would be a smaller star and uh, what color and it would have a longer life span. what coloration would it be uh you know with spitballing or working off memory i believe it would probably be more more on the orangey side okay so let's let's just do more of an orangey orangey side i don't know if that's too uh, let's see like that let's go more orangey right here all right so more orangey i'll do little little splashes of lighter 
just to kind of give that. And then the Earth, it's uh, this Earth-like planet is, is a, a, a rather large planet. And you said it's going to be a dimmer light, but it will still have, it won't be cold per se, but it'll be dimmer. It won't be as yeah. bright as the light that we have because it is a younger sun, correct? It's actually an older sun. Oh, an older sun that's sun. shrinking. Yeah, yeah. Now, as they grow older, do they shrink until they become a black well, hole that, or that do depends. they expand? I mean, no, no. So in the, in the lifetime of a star, uh, it has a, so our own stars, uh, its lifespan will be, what, about four to five, what, five billion, I believe, years old. Uh, and then um, it can either go uh, supernova, in which case uh, it would uh, form a black hole. Uh, kind of piercing a hole in the space-time continuum. Uh, it could also just, um, well, and usually what they do is they turn into red giants before they supernova. Okay. Uh, or sometimes they're, they're just like brown dwarfs. Sometimes they just kind of uh, just kind of burn away. You know, they don't really do anything super exciting. Sometimes what is left over is called a neutron star. And a neutron star is about two to three miles in, in diameter. Uh, and it's super concentrated um, uh, matter, so heavy that if you were to take a teaspoon of it and put it on, on Earth, it'd be like a, a billion tons. Wow. So there's no, uh, there's no escape velocity, meaning that you couldn't even fit an, electro, uh, an extra electron of mass onto that planet. Okay. Now, that link I sent you, Travis, yesterday was very interesting because they're talking about, well, what, what would life look like outside of our normal ideas of life? And they have theorized that even on such a thing like a inside of a neutron star, there could be some possibility of some kind of a life Of form. a light, right. Uh, not at all, yeah. But we have no way but of proving like that. We think of it. But we have no way of proving correct. that particular one. That is correct. Because we... Because how could we even get in there to... How could we even, like... Open the, open the hood and, and take a look at... Crushed. Yeah, exactly. So that I, I find so our, I find that really, really fascinating. Uh, so, so this star, of course, is going to be, uh, it's going to have a much longer lifespan. Uh, and as I said, there'll be more time for evolutionary processes, uh, to, to happen on, on the planet. But what I'm looking for, for your expertise today is the character called the Hexacat, because it's such a complicated character. Um, and it has six arms, uh, like a lot of, like cats that we think of here, they're kind of aloof. Uh, they, uh. I imagine that they hunt in packs, uh, but because they're also aquatic, that they would hunt in schools. Uh, we talked earlier that the Hexacap might have its own kind of built-in weapon, like its tail might be weaponized. Right. So maybe the tail would be like a spear, but almost like a jellyfish with nematocysts, those little firing you know, cells of, of uh, poison that inject themselves into the, into the prey. Um, but also imagining that the uh, that, that is an intelligent creature, perhaps like the dodecapod, uh, it also has bioluminescence. So uh, perhaps its uh, its body. Now we discussed that it really wouldn't have much fur. That wouldn't make much sense if it spends a lot of time in the water. Maybe more, as you said, like a polar bear. Maybe it even has scales in parts. You know. Maybe. Um, hey, there we go. Yeah. Uh, are you looking at what I'm drawing? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to create the I'm trying to set up the our 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 thing that we're doing here. So I'm gonna lighten that up just slightly, just so we can see it a little bit more. Uh, maybe I'll add a few a few stars in the background. Why not add? Oh, why not add a few stars? Shall we? And oh, I do want to mention one thing, Travis. Um, I'm not sure how long your series goes, but. I do have to give a talk at uh, about 4.10, so I will have to leave you, but you can certainly continue yep. um, wherever your progress is. So, so, And then it'll be like a Christmas present. I can see it later. So we, we, we've, got, we've got the, uh, the, the, the tilt, and actually what I can do here is I, I can, um, I'll just have this little, I'll lighten up uh, the poles and the names and everything for you. But we're going to jump into the Hexacat itself. So the Hexacat lives on this flat-ish world, mostly water. It's a predatory animal, so um, we've talked a lot of different things, and we'll, we're just going to go dive into it now. Um, it's, it's centered around a smaller, older sun. It's not that bright. 
Um, but it is still warm. It has a 45 degree tilt and it's, which causes the, the North and South Pole to be a little bit warmer and more tropical. Um, with that being said, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you right now um, what we were kind of uh, drawing here. Uh, let's see, I'll hide that, hide that, hide that. All right, so originally what I was drawing was trying to figure out what the shape of this thing would be and we were just spitballing so we were just like casually talking and things about um i was mentioning based on what we know about animals and predatory uh animals and how they adapt to their climate and their their habitats i was saying what if this creature was more like a polar bear um in the in terms of like a mix between like a polar bear and let's say an otter a sea otter or a uh, or an elephant seal or uh, you know something like that where it's maybe shorter shorter hair uh, what if the character was had bluish skin and we talked about also the fact that the the creature would be more humanoid so um, if it had like a purplish skin um, its predator one of its its meals would be like this de dodecapod um, we also talked about can it hold its its breath underwater could um it's could it have barb like um uh, you know like spikes like almost like hair but they barb out in terms of a self-defense you know when they're underwater against a larger animal um and oh, like a blow like a blowfish. like a blowfish or and and because it's adaptive to the water you know it would have webbed maybe more webbed feet we've already identified we want to do webbed right uh, I talked about maybe how the paws may look differently than other paws because oh, not that. Uh, let's go to let's go to a, yeah, not penguins. We we want we don't want penguins. Uh, let's talk about the the paws. Now we know that a typical um, you know we we're we we're, we're talking about shape, how tall this thing would be. Um, we're also talking about. Um, it needs to be air, you know, designed to swim really, really well. It also needs to be designed to possibly go deep depths and stay under for long durations of time. So it lives partially in the, in the, on the water and also on land. So it needs to have some sort of um, ability to hold its breath for length of time. So we thought, what if it had extra lungs? Oh, sorry. Chocho's making noises. Or what if um, we had it had extra bladders in which it could inhale, kind of like you know the fish that we see the um, the mud skippers that can swim out of that can walk out of water because they hold water in their lungs to be able to breathe longer, but they're actually breathing oxygen from the water and and which allows them to do that. What if we have the opposite for this creature, correct? And also since it's not that bright, the our eyes would be larger. So that's, these were sort of some of the things that we were, we were talking about. Uh, HD says, can you ask him if they swim underwater? Yes, they do swim underwater, HD. Um, Brush Mechanic says, I love this. I did so much research on, a, on the world for my, my story. That's awesome. Um, da, 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 da. HD says, this is really cool. Um, oh, Druby says, the decapod looks super radical. Um, so that's awesome. So um, I'll, I'll, guys, from time to time, I'll, I'll look at the chat room, so, but we're limited on time with Jasna since he's got to jump off at about four o'clock. Um, it's 3.32 now, right? So we got a half hour to design the sucker. So um, let's, let's go into it. Let's, let's figure out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up, uh, I'm gonna also, oh, by the way, if you guys haven't figured it out, we now have a Discord. And I'm looking, and we're we're getting people joining left and right, man. This is awesome. Thanks to Anita Womano, we we're gonna be offer also also offering, um, uh, we're gonna be offering um, draw coffee and, and draw with me, where those who are are subscribers to Twitch or Patreon can have one on one sessions with me um, for like a half hour, uh, and then we're gonna be developing workshops in the near future. So just wanted. to throwing a shameless plug there. Um, also, um, let's see here. I want to look at 
the one thing that I felt like this sucker could be close to uh, would be an animal that is, what would you say the temperature would be in Fahrenheit for this, this animal? And is it all over the planet? Is it, or is it, so it would have different species or, of humanoid? Uh, these creatures? Yeah, I, w I would imagine, like any planet, it'll be popular. Like our, like our climates, to a, to a great degree, uh, determine what kind of animals live where and what their design is, right? So, obviously, a polar bear is not going to be able to exist in a tropical environment very long, um, not unless it's got air conditioning. So, yeah, I would imagine, uh, just for the sake of this um, this particular ecosystem, that uh, it's it's a little colder than it is, and particularly underwater, it's always going to be cold, right? It's certainly, uh, I'm not imagining it to be an ice planet. So maybe, maybe uh, let's just say 35 degrees Fahrenheit might be your average temperature. Okay. So just to give you guys an example, and, and I just pulled this up really quick. On our planet alone, on planet Earth, um, if you type in feline species, you're going to find a plethora of different types of species, hundreds. And, you know, starting with cats, there are different types of species of cats, like domestic cats, lions, tigers, leopards, cheetah, cougar, jaguar, snow leopards, bobcat, clouded leopards, serval, rusted spotted cat, Can Canada lynx, uh, caracal. Um, uh, the caracals are pretty interesting because they, they're like a, a boxier, like puma, like mountain lion. Uh, Liberian lynx, leopard cat, palace cat. Palace cat looks pretty awesome. Fishing cat. Oh, there's an interesting one. We have a fishing cat. We have an ocelot. We have a margay. The, my door is open. Um, a jaguarunde. <laughs> a jaguarunde, a flat-headed cat. Our dogs are barking. Um, we have an oncela, marbled cat, Joffrey's cat, Asian golden cat, and the list goes on. And every single one of these cats looks a lot different from one another. And they're all specific to their surroundings that makes them a different species, how they've adapted. Uh, like my dogs, for instance, those standard schnauzers, their barking is, is an adaptive thing. They're instinctually doing that. They're, they're, they're ratters and diggers. So any small animal they see, they instinctually want to go after. Um, so all I'm saying with all of these different species of animals, we, we, we have an overwhelming, overwhelming responsibility, Jasno and I, to uh, create something from nothing based on just what we think might be in existence. So it's a Pandora's box, right? Anything could be, it could be really anything, but we're, we're trying to ground it with real science at the same time. Am I correct? You are correct. Okay. Correct. So let's start with the shape. Um, how big? It, it's, you said it's, a, it's bipedal, but it has four arms. Well, it can stand, it can stand up on, on its hind legs, but it may very well travel on its, uh, on all. It's got six appendages. So maybe four, four arms and then kind of what would be tantamount to hind legs. Okay, so let's, let's say, for instance, we, we've got, um, uh, you know, a shape that is similar to a polar bear. So, it, you know, it might have a more barrel chest because how often is it, how often does it stand on all fours versus how often does it swim? Because we know by designing, by design, quadrupeds have a limitation on where their arms can go based on how they're designed for being on all fours at any given time. 90% um, of their time they're on all fours or 95% of the time. Like what percentage are they on here? Standing on all fours, swimming versus standing on two legs. I, I would almost imagine because it probably uses um, all of its limbs for locomotion underwater that it probably uh, would be on land, probably more on its hind legs to preserve um, the other arms because you wouldn't want them to be damaged. It would be very important for its survival to be able to swim. Um, so not necessarily like a T-Rex where the arms look vestigial and don't look like they do anything, but it could very well be 
that the arms diminish in size as it goes up the body. Okay, so or it could or it could be the other way around. So you know, we were talking about um, what, why a cat? What makes it? What would make it a cat? Uh, <laughs> what would? That's a very good question. The, the the question is how far can you push it to where it still retains a cat-like quality? Uh, you know, a lot of them are, of course, you know, also behavioral. I mean, we know that, that cats tend to be, uh, as I said earlier, more aloof. They're not like dogs, you know, they, they don't tend to be as, uh, they're a little more autonomous and independent. Um, certainly, uh, we always associate with them tails. Uh, and obviously, we would associate uh, um, any cat with, you know, four, four legs, but it specifically has to do with the jointing of the legs. Right, so I think that whatever joint that we have in cats on Earth is the joints that we need to look at for for the arms in order to have at least some sense of being cat-like. So if it was on on all fours most of the time, it wouldn't have a typical, possibly just for muscular reasons, it wouldn't have your typical hind leg feel, which is correct. So you would yeah, you might, it might be. you might you might have a longer foot. Uh, that could almost resemble a cat mixed with a, 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 a an ape primate, let's say, with with um, a, a, a knee more like this. Maybe maybe this becomes the uh, the feel to it. Now the reason why I'm drawing it like this, and I'm just hypo these are all hypotheticals, uh, is because. Uh, it, it's not, it's, it doesn't need its hind legs. It might need its hind legs to, to burst in speed, but it might be flatter footed and longer, maybe even longer and sleeker so that it can swim and, and use, use its feet to kick and also close together when it's, it's moving through the water. Um, we, let's see here. We've got, uh, we've got, does anyone here have a link to Discord, please? Uh, Dylan says, I've never downloaded Discord so fast. Okay, that's awesome. Um, da -da 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 -da. Everyone's talking about other stuff. Uh, Brush Mechanic goes, I wonder if the look of the main coon cat would blend in well with the idea. The main coon cat. Oh, you know what? That might. That's a big, that's a big cat. Yeah, wow. the, 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 main, the main coon cat. Let's take a look at the main coon cat real quick. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, and that's a good one there, um, brush mechanic. Let's see here. Like Jack, Chang's cat. Maine Coon Cat. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're pretty big animals. Um, uh, although I imagined, even with, with the look of them, um, I, I was telling him is I thought it would be cool if you had the snout, you had a, you know, the nose, um, you had shorter ears, but you also, um, because it's underwater, it, it uses its feelers, its hairs, uh, receptacles to sense the most subtle of vibrations. And then we also talked about camouflage, right? Jasno, camouflage? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was directed to me. Yeah. yeah so maybe it's like Mullerian or Bullerian mimicry where, uh, well, I mean, you, we were talking about this just the other day that when an octopus dreams, it changes color. But even the notion like a chameleon that you could kind of adapt with the, with the surroundings, you know, to both, well, either to hide yourself uh, from predators or to disguise yourself from prey. It could, it could go one of two ways. And we were also talking about, I was saying, what if it could dislocate its, its jaw for bigger prey to grab onto yeah. and it had hook like that's great more hook like um uh teeth and you said something interesting to me earlier that i didn't realize teeth are what again in 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 our the biological world well from an evolutionary standpoint um teeth come from scales and or feathers kind of in the same family which is which is interesting, and so we were talking about having those um, scales, uh, having little not feathers so much as uh, spikes or spines spikes. that kind of are contracting while they're in the water, but when they um, are being attacked, they not only can change to fit their environment, 
which allow which means that they have to have a lot of extra sensory sensors that a decapod maybe it has a lot of things that it can mimic what a de dodecapod can do um, in order to catch its prey like rockfish i mean what are the, what are those abilities that these these um, octopus have that allow them to change their colors according to their mood or their their environment do we know? Uh, you... I'm, not entirely, I'm not entirely sure what the uh, biological uh, mechanism is. Um, it, it, it does seem to be a uh, something that happens all throughout nature. Uh, certainly, you know, it's funny because again, we were looking at those videos from the Nautilus, and remember, we we're looking at the YouTube videos of the most, uh, some of the most poisonous or dangerous animals on Earth are in fact octopi uh, that have some of them have um, you know poison that is that is much more lethal yep. than. Uh, you know, than, than even like a, a, a sea snake or a rattlesnake, that it could kill you in five minutes, uh, which is unbelievable. And, and these are like really small animals. So I would imagine the dodecapod would most likely have some kind of defense mechanism like that. Which that it would which, uh, it would probably have some kind of poisonous tendrils. Which these guys are immune to because they, over time they've already adapted that immunity. But they also have a tail that is spiked that they can use to kill the dodecapod with that maybe has its poison, a poison yeah. of its own. Other thoughts I had, because when I was designing the dodecapod based on the classroom specs, I was kind of designing it as somewhere between an octopus and a jellyfish, because it has uh, this kind of transparency with the super brain. It has bioluminescence. Um, and that was another, another cool thing we were talking about is the notion that if it's not a chlorophyll-based world, if, it, if you just change those parameters, maybe the entire world would look purple. Maybe the flora and the fauna would, would err on a, on a more cool spectrum. Um, so, and certainly the color you, you can get to later, uh, but yeah, I'm not exactly sure uh, if, if the uh, hexacat would itself have bioluminescence. Maybe it would need to in order to navigate under the water. Um, you know, I, I think, let's, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller here to kind of uh, make room for the feet. I think it would be cool. Or maybe the antenna. Maybe the antenna have a bioluminescence, well, I, like an angler. Which I also think maybe these spikes also have bioluminescence, as well as, as well as the tail. If the yeah, tail, if the tail um, had these, this barb, uh, you know. Again, we're just we're we're spitballing here today, guys. I just think this is really fascinating, and really interesting to kind of. And again, I'm doing this off the cuff where, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, oh, <laughs> someone says, AC says, come along great, really fascinating to see a professional at work. Uh, would those spines be retractable like Wolverine claws? I don't know if they would be retractable as much as um, I think what would be interesting is if the, uh, it had some sort of, um, it just flattens out. You know, and it, and when it when it flattens out, it's it's very um, unintrusive. So let's say you know, and again, I'm going to go over this in, in in black ink when I'm done. But let's say when it's it's on the on the its back, let's say right here, um, if it if it gets scared or if it goes into defense mode, um, it immediately pops up um, these these spines or spikes. And we're t and well, I'm also saying, what if these spines are bi have bioluminescence on them um, that allow them to glow, which gives them a really sleek pattern. So if they're, let's say, um, and I'm and I'm just designing a shape that I think would be cool for this because um, it it needs to go through the water um, again. I'm sure there are many, many people that would come up with multitude of ideas, artists, but I'm just thinking if it was going through the water, what would it look like in terms of um, coming at you in perspective? Let's see, the, 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 you'd have one. And I, I, I'm naturally thinking that um, this creature has longer paws um, that allows it to grab grab and hook things and then also has 
Uh, we, we also said four, four arms. So if we go back over here, the, the fourth arm, I, I'm, uh, I think would be um, a smaller version of the, the one on the top. Um, but what it d does have the ability to do is, again, grab onto extra things. It also has the ability to, as you're gliding through the water, um, it, can, it can spread itself out, allowing... Here's, a, here's another thought, Travis, could be interesting is, and I can't remember if you and I were talking about this, but if there's kind of like webbing between the arms, that it could also act as a parasail that maybe on windy days it could actually also, um, almost like a paraglider. Yeah. Follow along, you know, air currents. Uh, let's see here. So the webbing certainly between the fingers, but also webbing, maybe a little webbing under the arm. Like the, uh, what was it? The, uh, was it a vampire octopus? Yeah, the, we the, the vampire, Vamp vampire, the squid. vampire squid is what it was yeah. and and they they have their the vampire squid um they literally and i'll and i'll say maybe this is their hind legs have this kind of vibe extra skin to it like that we'll get rid of this one because that's that would be i think his the hind leg would look more like this or it's it's uh main leg here get a little quiet here um, Alice says the luminescence could be a, a way to lure the decapod absolutely it could mimic maybe the mating uh, yeah. the mating habits of a decapod oh uh, so, so maybe maybe its tail is the is what is the lure. It's the weapon and and the lure at the same time. So so then would the tail be slightly longer, perhaps? Could be. Um, and then maybe the tail starts off a little bit off the back. So rather than maybe the the tail, um, if his hind legs are right there, maybe the. Kind of like it can, the tail can, can, uh, for lack of a better word, stiffen and, and recontract depending on blood pressure that it has. It can allow itself to be uh, sleek uh, or it can stiffen up and be like spiked likes when it goes into the, like with jolts of adrenaline, which allows it to go into bar mode. So when it's on land, um, it can loosen up per se um, and you said something interesting that I thought was kind of funny do they procreate like you said they're not involved with the like how do they create life so there's a whole whole thread on uh, that notion uh, and I can actually read from it here let me see. yeah no, no um, this is it because well, so, people talk about this right this is this is this yeah, was a heated dis so, this is somewhat of a big discussion yeah so let me see here let me find the thread but uh, essentially and there's all sorts of like rabbit holes uh, where you can talk about just you know do they see in color you know do they see in black and white? Um, you know, uh, these various creatures. Uh, and then, of course, there's this uh, paper that Moya just put on the site that had to do with, uh, it's an interesting paper that speculates a triparental species where three parents are needed for sexual reproduction. Um, that, that, so that, sounds, that sounds very bizarre. <laughs> um, th this yeah, is a kid-friendly, yeah, so. this is a very kid-friendly uh, <laughs> show but at the same time i mean life <laughs> life doesn't we're talking nature though we're talking yeah. nature uh, not nothing salacious here but um because you know that obviously there's asexual reproduction um there's different types of reproduction like for instance like the seahorse if i'm not mistaken is the one just like with the penguin where it protects the egg or or it actually i think in the case of the seahorse if i'm not mistaken doesn't it actually carry the babies 
Once it fertilizes a female, she gives it back to them, and then it's the actual male that carries. So all bets are off when it comes to nature. You know, who knows? Um, but that was an idea that was floated, the notion that it, it could take three to make one. Um, or the notion, there was also another notion originally that it, that it could be um, uh, asexual reproduction, that it would uh, not require two parents at all. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, this is world building and it's science fiction, so it's whatever the group decides. I think it's kind of interesting, the notion of having a, a, a third, you know, not having two parents, but uh, or one one female and one male parent, but uh, like kind of like a third parent. And uh, a third parent could be what exactly? Is it a different... It, it may be a different species. Like a symbiotic relationship with another animal that allows it... Uh, Correct. So, for instance, maybe, maybe this other. This is more van. Where, we're talking more vampire-like, right? Maybe, maybe uh, the the eggs get stored in the symbiotic creature and then kind of get retrieved from this. That's very, very, very interesting. And I, I'm going to add a weird spin, although this this could be ridiculous. But wouldn't it be interesting? If that, if that species was, in fact, the dodecapod. So I had to hunt the dodecapod for, for its very survival, for procreation. Uh, someone says, uh, Brush Mechanics says, those spines could act as glowing flaps as it glides or rudder. This could be, a, this is a cool creature. Or Brush Mechanics says, one that seeds, one that fertilizes, and one that incubates. Yeah, we, we, go. We've got some interesting feedback here from... Oh, some great notes, great notes. Well, it's it's always good, you know, to have these. This is what I love about having uh, these friends of mine that are on here that I've, I've made or uh, since starting Sketch to Animate is that everyone here, you know, the one thing that we all have in common is we want to world build and create stories to tell. Um, and But everyone has really interesting ideas and how they want to approach their own. Um, that's why I'm, I'm really fascinated by this class now, um, by what, what, what you could do with it. Now, um, we also talked about the eye having, um, a, when it goes underwater, it, it also has a, a third eyelid, that kind of like a reptilian, um, that allows yeah, it. Yeah, it's uh, called a, it's a nictitating membrane. Nictitating. Or like a frog. Membrane. Yeah. So like if yep. So it's it's like a it's like a gelatinous sheet. So it it's like having goggles basically. It protects your eye. Yeah. So let's say for instance, uh, we have we'll do this. We'll we'll create this little quick drawing over that, and then we'll do another uh, darker one. And let's say this one will go a little lighter. If that was the eye, you'd have some sort of thing that would flap over it. And uh, did we did we like the idea that this this creature is more purplish in color? Uh, well, the, certainly, uh, as I mentioned, the decapod itself has uh, has a lot of kind of purple flourishes. Uh, certainly would uh, would match. It'd be in some ways of the same universe. But it could it, it could have its own you know patterns. Um, and I would even say that those spikes um, become you know part of the fur. So let's say the make sure this is it right here. Yep, this is it. Um, the uh, if this is the eye, even around the eye, we have little nicks of spines that are more like bumps. That as it gets bigger and goes out further, um, they're almost a cross between hairs and feathers, right? They could just be like a porcupine. Would a porcupine's spines be considered? similar to a, a bird feather? 
and how they. I mean, I'm sure one. I'm sure one could draw an evolutionary, um, you know, comparison. That they both seem to be quill have quills, right? Right. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to. I'm just throwing a little. Little highlight in the eye right there. So let's say that's this is the eye. And then the eye itself. So if it had these little things that kind of protrude from it, or uh, you know that are on the surface, um, I like I still like the idea if it's going to be feeling like it has those hairs that stem from uh, its muzzle, its its front its nose area, and then even yeah. even extra almost like a lynx for their hair on top it has those uh, little extra appendages that kind of grow out that actually can manipulate and move along with the ears, especially if it's underwater. Th this, could, this could be little sensors that pick up um, the creature or the deca the, the decapod or vibrations of a of a prey a predator that's after them now what would be after them that would be in this world would what 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 would they fear the most um and do they do they die do they have disease do they have the, you know it, uh, we, we've talked about this the other night when we you and i were talking about uh greenland sharks and things that are virtually immortal was it, was it a type of uh, was it a type of jellyfish? Jellyfish, yeah, that, the immortal jellyfish. The immortal jellyfish, mm -hmm. which basically can uh, re regenerate its uh, kind of adolescence as it ages. It's regenerate its adolescence. That's crazy. That's just crazy talk. <laughs> now I've made this cat's head, this hexa cat's head, smaller. And um, and its body bigger, but the, with the cheek, it'll it'll maybe its mouth can go back further, maybe. Um, and again, this is just initial drawings as we're talking. We're just doing simple doodles. These are just doodle sketches, of course, um, based on just our own knowledge. Now, I I want to go back in and redraw this again. Because I almost thought it'd be cool to see him. We do a run cycle of them, and then do oh, then 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 have them jump into the water and swim. And do a swim cycle. I'll animate the water. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, you make me. Uh, in in relatively. You can do all the heavy lifting. Yeah, in in relatively sp uh, animation terms, I'll do the heavy lifting. Thank you. Jerk. Well, I I could do the bubbles too. I could do like a bubble cycle once he's underwater. Yeah, I don't. I yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if the the lower jaw would be slightly bigger, like if if he had, if you know, this you know we with these creatures they have a, like a, a cat they have this jaw but what if what if this jaw was slightly bigger? And let's see here. I gotta check to see if I get any emails. Uh, are you guys still on the line with me, guys? Everyone's still out there watching? It's a. Uh, it's a lot of fun, Travis. It's somewhere between, as you said, it's somewhere between a cat and an otter. Uh, it, it definitely is, is uh, it still is cat-like. 
I think another thing that makes it very um, feline is just kind of the S curves in it. I always think of all these different interesting S curves when you think of the tail of the cat. Well, certainly the whiskers. Uh, you know, and what would be interesting with the neck, let's say the neck is like this. I'm, and I'm looking at this right now, thinking to myself, um, self, uh, what if his neck flattens out once he's in the water, just like on land? Um, you know, like, uh, when you see, when you see certain types of, uh, reptilians or sugar gliders spread themselves out squirrels flatten themselves out to to, to slow the the g-force down so when they land they land softer so they completely flatten themselves out before they land and then curl in their feet just before they they touch and in the same instance of this what if we had the um the character the creature flattens its neck out more. Um, before it, 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 it goes off into the water. Um, I'm just thinking of different things. You were saying if it's flying through the air and let's say, I, I still like this shape design that's more of a, of, of a snake, rattlesnake flatness of the of the eyes and the, the, the skull. Uh, but what if its neck flattens out like that? <laughs> wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be awesome if like it, it literally like I, I told you, there's there's uh, flying squids that can propel themselves out of the water for like 30 meters to, to avoid predators. Um, what if like this yeah. this creature literally f is a glider over the water hunting? Well, now this is interesting too because we've been talking about uh, this character um, obviously predating upon the dodecapod. And of course, the interesting twist in this conversation, which I'd like to share with, with uh, the class tonight, uh, which is the notion of the dodecapod actually being necessary for survival, not for food, but for reproduction, maybe reproduction and food. But there's a third character, which I think they're calling a Voltor, uh, which is an airborne creature. So maybe, maybe it predates on this character, and maybe this character does need the ability to glide in the air. Uh, because it's it's uh, it's prey uh, to the Voltors. I haven't read up enough on that thread, so I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, definitely, they're they're trying to keep it within the spectrum of, of that ecosystem. Yep. Uh, now you're we've we've only got a short amount of time left with you. Um, it, I have to go in four minutes. Yep. So um, and then we can have the the tail. Let's see, the tail comes in like this. And yeah, it's somewhere between a cat, an otter, and a bat. <clears throat> now I have to I have to think about this a little bit further, but um, if its chest allows itself to flatten out completely, um, based on this design. then what we can do is, I, and I still think it, it would have like a grayish, uh, purplish skin tone to it uh, with some, with some uh, spotted patterns. And then of course, when it goes underwater, the deeper depth it goes, it automatically lightens up with bioluminescence, um, which because it feeds on a decopod, it has a naturally reoccurring um, it uses the, 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 the same bioluminescence that it has. Uh, if you notice that small hammerhead sharks in certain coastal regions, I think of uh, like uh, the Caribbean islands or, or, or South America, they're, they are a different color because of the crustaceans that they eat, uh, because of the shrimp. Um, it, they have a, like a reddish color, I think it is, because of their diet. 
Um, and then, of course, as they get older and they become eat other types of fish, uh, they lose that that coloration. Uh, at one point, they thought it was a different species of, of some kind, and then they realized, no, it's because um, of the habitat in which its food source came from. It had that that coloration as a young um, adolescent, I think, hammerhead shark. It might have been a young hammerhead shark is what it was. I'll have to look it up again, but it was really interesting, fascinating. So you can see this jazz know what I've got here. You know. Yeah, that's great. You know, and I'm just, again, blocking this out. And it, it's, it's really fun drawing this with you, Jasno, and having you come on here. Um, uh, Brush McKenna says, maybe the lungs are close close to the back so the chest can flatten and also to be a flotation device mechanism. Um, either way, it's adaptive both on land and on water. And I think with that being said, yeah. um, oh, and I forgot, I keep forgetting the extra arm. Hold on. Before you, the extra arms. I was gonna say. Uh, yeah. We got to throw in those those, those <laughs> extra arms, which which would um, allow it to uh, to rise above. Now, if that's the case, and I always think that the extra arms were a bit smaller. Uh, in this case, um, they act. They they have a a, a reason for being smaller. That they, they can they can hold things. Um, they can grab onto things, of course. You know, they're they're when they're attack, you know, attacking something, but maybe they're mostly used for um, extra agility or um, just an extra smaller pair of hands to scoop things and collect things as they're as they are um, going after another set of prey with their forearms and and back legs or other hind legs. Um, since they're more quadruped or bipedal. Um, I don't know what we would call that, <laughs> to be honest. I don't know what you would, what you would want to call yeah. that in general. But with that being said, well, well, Travis, I, um, I want to thank. I do. I do need to run. Yeah, I want to thank um, Jasno for coming on here. Go ahead, Jasno. Yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, I can't wait to see the final. Uh, this is just absolutely amazing. It's it's uh, it's great watching you because uh, you brainstorm with your hands, right? That's a uh, that's a really cool thing. You, 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 you literally can draw as fast as you think. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing talent. Um, so certainly, uh, I, I don't even want to tell you how long it took me to do that single stupid decapod. I just do not have the capacity to, uh, to think as, as, as rapidly as you yeah, do. Yeah, so but that's, you, that's you can rapidly come up with um, puns and, uh, and, and give, it, give, it, give us a couple of puns. Before you leave. Oh, uh, you know what? I, 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 I'm just filled with bad dad jokes. That's about it. So, uh, but uh, on that, I do must, I, I must leave everyone. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Um, thank you, Jasno. Quick, te quick technical question. If I quit out of here, it just quits out my side. It doesn't affect your podcast. In nope. Any way. It doesn't affect me whatsoever. So, okay. All right. All right. Jasno. See the final. Take care, everybody. Talk to you later. Take care. We're gonna switch it over here real sec, real quick. Oh, I don't know what happened there. There we go. Uh, there we go. All right, so I am, uh, I enjoyed that. I don't know if you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> bad jokes, oh wait, Alice, you have no idea. He is the king of bad jokes. J Chocho, is Jazz? Just... the prince. Says the prince. <laughs> <laughs> Crowning says the prince. Nice. Okay, this is a kid-friendly room, so uh, we just got to remember that. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoy that. I know I didn't get much done here, and we did a lot of talking, but I'm gonna probably take this, run with a little bit. I I kind of like something with this thing here, and I'm gonna explore that a little bit more. I do like that foot there. Um, and I, and I think that um, we do have something here that we can work with. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this. I'm going to run with it, see what I can come up with, and then I'll post it later, uh, maybe put it in the Discord. If you guys get a chance, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know this was a last-minute impromptu thing. I'm going to consider doing another day on Twitch. 
that everyone can attend um, because Monday nights is just we have a lot. Of, we have really solid followers, and they're awesome people. But I want to get more people involved because we're doing really awesome drawovers. We had three or four drawovers last night um, for the Monday night stream. But I want to do more of this, and also uh, check out our Discord. Go to um, Sketch to Animate. Uh, I post. Uh, I post it on Facebook and Twitter and Twitch. All of the Discord information. So if you get a chance, go ahead and check that out. And also, I'm trying to think what else. We have a, a show that I'm developing. Um, well, of course, I have lots of shows. But we threw one in the foreground, uh, which is a music video-based concept. But it's going to be a TV show. But we're using the first initial idea as a music video teaser. Um, so check that out in the coming months or coming month or so. Uh, we'll be uh, doing that over this month and next month trying to diligently uh, develop that and get that further along so that we can make this uh, show. It's, it's mixing music. My, my good friends uh, in Swamburger, uh, who is the mastermind behind the music itself, and we're going to get some other awesome uh, hip-hop artists involved in this uh, once, once we get it more developed. But look for that soon. We've already started promoting it. Um, and thank you to Anita for all that she does for developing the Discord. Thank you to Zula for doing all of the social media that she's been doing. If you haven't noticed, we have been, our, all the social media postings that you see currently have been Zula, who has been the mastermind behind getting out that because I literally have no time to do anything anymore other than work and draw and try to make some more videos for everyone. The back to basic tutorials, I've got to, I got to do a couple more of those and develop our very first sketch to animate paid tutorial that you guys can download and purchase in the near future. So with that being said, um, I hope you enjoyed this. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, if you want to go check out that link, I posted it in here earlier, go check it out. Um, and then maybe you, and maybe we'll all be in the class together. That wouldn't that be fun? We all take the class. I think it's like a hundred bucks or something like that. hundred us dollars. But anyways, have a great day guys. Um, with that being said, I'm going to do my little outro that I always do. And where is it? There we go. And that's it. So I will talk to you guys later and check back in and let's see how this hexacat is going. All right. Peace out. All right, that didn't work. Peace out.